And when I, if I ask you a question, yeah. um, it'd be great if you could sort of restate it. If I said, yeah. was rock and roll influential in pop design? You say, well, rock and roll influenced pop design yeah. that way. You just sort of restate. You have a tape speed. Okay. There we go. Okay. Um, is uh, pop fashion more important to pop culture than rock music? Or is rock and roll just an excuse to dress up? Is pop fashion more important than... Say that again? Is pop fashion more important to pop culture than rock music, than the music itself? Or is it is rock and roll just an excuse to dress up? Well, I think you can, you know... It, there aren't any rules, really, I guess. And But, I mean, people used rock and roll, obviously, as an excuse to dress up. I mean, it was a way of getting out of the house and feeling excited about yourself and I think at the same time it must have been a marvellous uh, thing in the 50s to um, I suppose get involved in the whole idea of dressing up to mess up and that was an act of, of hardcore rebellion that really was also a great way of announcing your sexuality and clothes were really uh, designed to look sexy in. I mean, the most extraordinary thing, I think, about the 50s, if that's what you're getting at, and the origins of rock and roll dress and style and music, the most extraordinary thing from my point of view is that the styles of the girls' clothes in the 50s were styles that really originated at the turn of the century, in the days of uh, the fiend de siècle or the naughty 90s, it was Belle Epoque. And the man who really designed those clothes had no idea of rock and roll and had no real genuine interest in any of it. He was a French designer called Christian Dior. And Christian Dior obviously uh, had a few problems about his mother. And uh, his mother was one of these real... Uh, incredible conservative aristocratic women who obviously put him in the corner all the time and made him feel he was terribly ugly and she was fantastically beautiful and influenced him obviously during the course of his life and when he finally at the age of 40 I think embarked on a fashion career just after the war World War II when France was on its knees and the couturier business was something that America quickly, as the, its most firmest supporters and certainly its most expensive and most lucrative supporters, uh, closed the doors because they decided, I guess, after the war that they had no interest in this old European couturier fashion. They had just invented rock and roll. They'd invented the zip. They had practical clothing suddenly this whole idea of American practical clothing that was affixed to sports, was affixed to um, things to do with uh, cowboys. It had nothing to do with this old-fashioned baroque and rather decadent air of the French couture houses. But the extraordinary point was that here, with all in the 40s, with all these very practical clothes, and, and uh, women becoming much more androgynous than ever before. Since the 20s, they'd thrown out the bras, they'd cut the dresses short, women had cut their hair short in the Eton crop, and you had all those wild 20s flapper girls in the Charleston. And this developed onward into the 40s, where you had these very severe-looking women, you know, with these tight, tailored suits, wearing trousers, very similar to men's clothes. Against all that, this extraordinary, not very attractive man called Christian Dior suddenly decided to design his mother's clothes. And really what he did was he sent it to be influenced by La Belle Epoque and brought back this whole grand look again. Pumped out thighs, huge petticoats, decolletage with girls wearing clothes which revealed their whole top just like these Victorian women who sat at home waiting for Papa to come back and never moved, corseted like crazy and uh, with waist some, uh, that I think they even took certain bones out of their uh, bodies and had special operations to ac acquire a 16 or 17 inch waist. Th th this look, this hourglass shape 
became something that Dior brought back at the end of the 40s and the beginning of the 50s. It was a look that staggered everybody in America and staggered everybody across Europe because it was so old-fashioned. Dresses fell down to the, to the ankles. There was tons and tons of material, voluminous skirts, people sewing brassiers back into dresses. Things that they'd thrown out in 1920 were now being fitted back in 1950. Well, who is to consider this kind of look that was so antiquated, so restrictive, so conservative, so much of the Victorian age was to come back in 1950 and be coined by an American journalist, the new look. This man saved basically France from falling on its knees and becoming an old decadent couturier business, brought it all back and people are still living off it today in Europe. He basically turned the French fashions into an amazing mega empire again and unknown to anyone else, across the high streets of the world, his dresses, which were basically representations of his mother's Belle Epoque, with all these voluminous petticoats underneath, with these little cinch waist, with these bras that girls of 16 were filling up with Kleenex tissues inside their dresses, were just figments of Christian Dior's aristocratic, conservative, bourgeois mother wearing La Belle Epoque. And here they were, all across America, dancing with James Deans. Luckily, for all of us perhaps, Christian Dior didn't design men's clothes, mm -hmm. only women's. So here he had it, icons of his mother, all across America, all across the world, dancing to rock and roll, these Belle Epoque look. No one would, how? Why should someone be wearing all these vast petticoats, sewing bras in, things that they destroyed 40 years ago? Here they were in what was a subversive act, this jungle music that people called about. Here was women in La Belle Epoque costume, dancing to James Dean. That's the most extraordinary fact in rock and roll style ever, because no one would ever have believed, if you dreamt it in your wildest dreams, that such a thing could ever happen. No, how? Why? There's no real answer to it. But that, that, that became rock and roll style and is still today. I mean, Godness, Cindy Lauper is, is, is another figment. Now, um, to move on to something that relates to that. Yeah. Um, the question I have is, Connie Francis, Annette Funicello, Brenda Lee, they were, they dressed demure, like you're describing here. Yeah. And you think it was an outgrowth, I mean, as you described it, was it uh, a sign of the times? Or was it At those times, if I remember rightly, my source material, because I was a fashion student for years, and I come from a world of fashion, and I, 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 though I became a painter, I was still totally wrapped up in the world of fashion, and I'd read a lot of source material, and I remember reading cuttings, press cuttings, where women in Paris, literally, and I think this has never ever happened before in fashion, if they ever saw a woman wearing a Dior or a Dior type skirt, they would savage her, brutalize her, and literally rip her clothes off her back. Now, there is no other fashion or fashion designer that that's ever happened to. I remember the days when Dior was a shy, portly, unglamorous man, nothing that you would actually attach as an image to these glamorous frocks that Ava Gardner was flying in to buy at thousands of dollars, and Elizabeth Taylor and Vivian Lee and all of them from Hollywood, because this was glamour being brought back. Women became these hourglass shapes, Jane Mansfield, Marilyn Run Monroe, the icons of rock and roll 50s style. Hollywood wanted it. They didn't want this severe look. It brought all this terrific glamour, technicolour. This whole look was so 50s and so rock and roll. And the most extraordinary thing, Christian Dior held his fashion shows in silence. Never had any music, wasn't interested, didn't know what rock and roll was. However, getting back to your point, what I was saying is that even in New York, women were holding placards when Dior arrived at Bergdorf Goodman's to give a lecture and to sign autographs as a public appearance for these new clothes. Women were outside with huge placards. It said, Monsieur Dior, we abhor dresses to the floor. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then that, and, and that was the real rebellion. People hated it because 
it went against everything to do with feminine liberation. To, it was constricted, it was putting women back in a, in a corset. It was making women, um, sexuality suddenly uh, centered and, and sold and very priority. But no rock and roll girl cared about that. For them, it was, they used it in a different way, you see. They took that style, wanted to put it on the high street, throw it into the prom balls, fuck around or whatever it was, mess around in the clubs that existed, get out on the streets. It was a way of announcing their sexuality in the most provocative way. They didn't want to not uh, show their breasts. They wanted to actually push them out. They wanted to be very sculptural. They wanted to be this Teutonic, blonde-haired, lunatic, Aryan, cosmetic, sexual device. Right? right? They wanted to be it, so they used it all. And all those petticoats, well, it looked so mysterious as you would fondle and, you know, and, and precariously kind of deal with your hands underneath the dresses. I mean, it was just more interesting today. It's just a wraparound skirt. It's not as mysterious. It was all these things they all added. And, of course, the cinch waist gave everybody this very sexual shape. Well, it was a lovely contrast to the guys, because the guys, I suppose, dug out what was very black, what was only existing in the ghettos. And I think Elvis Presley was one of the first to do that. Right. His hair was red, but he dyed it black. Why? Because he hung out downtown downtown parts of Memphis where only black guys were hanging around. And what did they sell in those black little shops? Big pink jackets, wide shoulders, this whole incredible peacock-like look that was flash and went perfect to the beat. Why? Because he emulated these black performers, I guess, who traveled around in little circus acts, playing blues, rhythm and blues, all sorts of music that he finally got inspired by and harnessed. And I suppose it was the first white man to dress up and dance and sing like a black man. And he became an outrageous phenomenon which everybody wanted to emulate because he was the jungle spirit. He had that true pagan rock and roll anarchic quality and what a better marriage you could have than, than a figure that looked like that, dancing with a girl that was basically this perversion of Dior's mother all across the world, that was your style. Is, is that why you think uh, millions of teenage guys imitated Elvis Presley, was this Oh, character. I think the, the reason the imitation of Elvis Presley because he looked, again, a wonderful sexual device. That was the whole thing. That heavy, shiny black hair. I mean, if you had like, hair like mine in those days, it would be ridiculous. You'd be thinking of uh, Bozo the Clown, right? But, I mean, if it was all slick back and shiny and black, it was very sexual, that whole feeling. The, the fact that um, uh, you could um, grow your sideburns down a bit was very tough and sexual and very macho. The fact that your shoulders were accentuated three inches on either side gave you a very big and masculine and tough look. The fact that the clothes were bright took you outside of the bank manager's office. No one could ever know that you would work in a bank or you would work in some office. No, how could you? Not with a jacket like that. You were a a, you, you, you were a, like a traffic light and you stop people in their tracks and that announcement was like the announcement of your whole sexuality it was a demonstration of your sexual prowess and rock and roll was a, w w was a wonderful excuse and a marvellous aid for kids to do that and create this what became known I suppose in the 50s as the generation gap and the voice of the teenager Now what about... Um if Presley was inspired by the blacks uh, in the 50s, what about Little Richard or Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley? Their zoot suit looks. Uh... Yeah. Well, they obviously didn't have to be inspired by anybody. They were, you know, for all intents and purposes. Like I the guess the kings were... of rock and roll. They really, you know, Chuck Berry, it, it, you know, I mean, gave the whole of the rock and roll world those three chords and that classic songs of Johnny B. Good and School Days and Maybelline and Nadine and... I mean, and, and the walk, and the, he was rock and roll, and all you had to do was just remember some of it that seemed to stick out in those rock and roll movies or capture it on the sleeve of a record to imitate it. And, of course, you know, every group literally in England finally did in the 60s. What, back in the 50s, can you think of anyone else who imitated the blacks as well as Presley did or...? Their I think their that I think that there wasn't anybody really quite as sexually potent. It was his look. I I guess you know 
his face was like this, inc this incredible set, you know, just f filled with sex. I mean, uh, if you looked at Jerry Lee Lewis, he was a killer, a master pianist, obviously a, a musician way over and above Presley's talents, because Presley's talents was more in his sexuality, his look, and his singing. Jerry Lee Lewis didn't quite have that together. He was tr much more southern. He wasn't so black inspired. He, he he was a different kind of act. Carl Perkins was a different kind of act. He, people didn't realize or quite catch on to that sexuality. When that, that sexuality, when a, a white guy was beginning to look like a black guy and singing black songs, it was that melting pot and that kind of, uh, of source that was dynamite. And I don't think they were so aware of it. You know, you're ne it's always the whole thing. In retrospect, you can see how it works. You never write manifestos before the action. Manifestos are always written after the action, and he was the action. Five years later, everybody was looking around and saying, gee, let, how can we create another Presley? We've now got the model. He was the model. He was the frame. He was the point of reference. You had Gene Vincent. You had Eddie Cochran, who came a little later and was a child prodigy guitarist and looked wonderful. You had Johnny Burnett and his rock and roll trio. You had Roy Orbison. You had Jerry. You had Carl Perkins. You had lots and lots of guys. And in the 60s, you had your Fabians and your, your Frankie Avalons and so on. And they all looked versions of but they never were quite right. They never had the, quite the desperation either. I think the big thing with Elvis was he looked desperate always. He looked lean and he looked hungry. And, and that, you know, perpetrated an energy in his style that was devastating. When he went into the army, of course, he came out as the all-American boy and they painted up the record covers with bright rosy cheeks and he was different. He wasn't quite the same. He never re really captured again that tremendous hungry sexuality that you knew was coming out of those cotton fields and, and deep white southern poor families and uh, that was something that, um, that I think probably in England and in New York and everywhere um, was something that people didn't really even know about then because you didn't travel as much. I mean, today, everybody knows about everything tomorrow. You know, what's happening in England, you'll know in Sydney, and you'll, what happened in Sydney, you'll know in New York. The, the communication gap in those days, everything was a lot more mysterious. No one really knew where all this. No one even knew he dyed his hair. The fact that he did was just extraordinary at the time, if you think about it. No one, who knows that he had red hair? That's a, a, amazing. You didn't. So that's it. All, all those things helped a great deal, and I think that finally he 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 really did become that frame model. And I can't think of any other singer at the time in terms of girls, though. What? I don't not sure there. I think girls weren't into girl singers. I think girls were just into getting the guys, and they just wanted the style. I think, you know, I don't think girls went screaming and trying to imitate Brenda Lee or, or uh, Connie Francis, who was just some Jewish American princess who looked ridiculous at times. And, and the girls did not have the politics. They didn't really have the, that, that edge. They didn't really have a sense of change about them. They weren't as desperate looking. They looked, uh, they didn't look rock and roll. I, I mean, I try to think of a, you know, you can what, think of the hardcore like Wanda Jackson and... What do you think would I have happened, uh, what, what do you think would have happened if a girl had tried to look like Elvis Presley? If she tried to be tough or Jerry Lee Lewis? If she tried to look like Elvis Presley? I think the world would have severely changed. I think, I think that we would not be living in times where, uh, where... I think the androgynous quality in that respect, when, when a girl had to be tough, um, I just think the world would be very different. I think it, if that had happened then, the world would have been a lot more radical than it is today. And rock and roll would have probably um, been ultimately a more useful tool for, for kids to express themselves with than it's come today, which is more like a business. It just developed into a major corporate business, like most other ex, ex, uh, mediums of expression. I, I think that what you're saying there was just too sophisticated an idea at the time. 
girls just wanted to be girls and they wanted to look like girls and they wanted to look extreme versions of sexual devices. That's, that, that's what Dior gave the world, I'm afraid, at La Belle Epoque at that time. No one can determine why at that time it was needed and used in the way it was, but it was. And girls were girls and boys were boys. I think in the 40s, boys looked more like girls and girls looked more like boys. And you, you probably go back and you'll see far more androgynous strains. And it's extraordinary now, when you bring it right into the 80s, how this androgynous quality seems so unique. But it wasn't really. It's only unique in comparison to the extremities of, uh, of sexual role models that you, you know, that you had in the, in the, um, in the uh, 50s. Great. Okay. Let's stop right here for right now and we'll change tapes.